thank you. And um, we're joined uh, in the studio by Pastor Dia Moodley. Hi, Dia, and welcome to the Politics Show. Well, it's good to be here. Thank you. Now, why is a pastor on a politics show? Well, I mean, you should ask me. I invited you, but you know, you can you just explain why uh, politics come knocking on your door, dear? Well, politics has come knocking on our door in the sense that uh, the, the local constabulary have decided that um, um, they're going to take me to task over the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion, and they've decided that uh, they have now suddenly experts at theology and biblical hermeneutics. And uh, sorry, what hermeneutics? Hermeneutics, uh, biblical hermeneutics. It's the hermeneutics is a word that describes the interpretation of scripture, and so the local constabulary have taken on themselves to to decide that my version of Christianity is not acceptable in the public square. So it's your interpretation of so, Christianity. So so, so, we, so you have the local constabulary challenging my biblical interpretation of the Bible. Well, that's very strange. Now, have they done that formally, informally? They've they've done it formally. Yes. So uh, what they've done is they've served me. A warning notice. But so, so just, just just to give the context here, Tony, um, my preaching involves a dialogue. It involves debate in the public square. I invite people to to come along and ask a question. I hold up a sign that says, "Ask me any question." You so can, this is in city centre here in is, Bristol, in Broadmead. In Broadmead, this is the way we do it. Uh, the crowd grows from from one person to um, you know two hundred in minutes, <laughs> and so when, and so when the crowd gets out of control. The police take the course of least resistance. So rather than challenging the crowd about their blasphemy or what they're swearing or the threats of violence, they decide to silence the preacher, who's one man. So rather than go against 100 people, they go against one man. So they've taken the path of least resistance by coming out against people. Well, to be fair to the police, they're just looking at a way to make sure that, that this conflict on the streets doesn't happen. Well, th- 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 there is there is no – well, if if they were keeping the law, they'd make sure – because, like, for example, Tony, when I, so when I sat with the police in um, uh, Bridewell, um, a chief inspector said to me, he said, dear, listen, there's, there's a community that sits opposite me at this table who says they're very unhappy with you challenging their view, for example, of Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or the LGBTQ. And I said to them, well, listen, I respect their community, but don't you also agree there's another community called the Christian community that has a biblical worldview that equally needs to be, needs to be you know, protected? So I say that, that when you wear in the constabulary uniform, you're representing the government, you're representing the law, your view of whatever I'm saying or not saying should not come into play. It's whether I'm breaking the law or not. So if I break the law, arrest me. If I'm not breaking the law, then you need to protect So have me. they arrested you? No, they haven't arrested me because there's nothing in the, I, I've done to cause them to arrest me. So how come you're sitting in uh, one of these police stations and chatting with them? That's because I took the step to do what no other street preacher or pastor has ever done in the history of the United Kingdom. I stepped into the constabulary to tell them what we're doing, how we're going about it, to prevent this sort of thing happening. And that's one of the reasons I've not been arrested is because I went in and I worked with the chief inspector for three years. And he said to me, what are you doing? This is not acceptable. And he eventually wrote, the constabulary wrote me three letters of apologies because they, they, their inspectors were actually breaking the law by stopping us preaching. Uh, they were seizing our signboards and trampling it underfoot, um, um, you, know, you know, telling us all sorts of things that we're not supposed to be saying, apparently, uh, that is offensive to people. Okay, uh, so give us an idea of uh, the sorts of incidents, the sort of things that you were saying and the sort of reaction you were getting from some elements in the crowd. Okay, so, so, so the warning notice, maybe that's a good way to start. The warning notice that they issued me in uh, 2021 said this, right? One of the points is this. Dear Moodley is not allowed to speak to an evolutionist or an atheist. How on earth do you come up with that? Since when have evolutionists and atheists become a group to be protected by law? Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I have no idea. So why are they saying that? Well, they're saying that because part of my preaching involves, like I said, a debate. So I'm debating an evolutionist. So an evolutionist walks up to me and says, you guys believe in a fairy tale. There is no God. Creation does not exist. There's, there's millions of years of science and evolution, blah, blah, blah. And I say to them, well, okay, good. I'm going to hear your story. Tell me how you went from bacteria to Beyonce over eons of time. Well, let me just stop you there for a second, because if you go back into time, not that long ago, actually, they would be the one who would potentially be arrested, or in fact, maybe even something worse would happen to them for having those views. Yes. Yeah. Listen, this, this, this idea that uh, you can't challenge somebody in the public square is ludicrous. Uh, uh, so, so this idea that I'm challenging them to explain their position. And so they could step up and ask me a question. I, I will answer it very easily. And I welcome them 
to ask me a question, I welcome them to challenge me, as long as I, as long as I can challenge them back. And the same with Islam. So the Muslim steps up to me and says, um, Jesus Christ is not real, he's not, a, he's not God, he's merely a Rasul, he's merely a prophet. I say, okay, great, let's go back and look at the history of Islam and how Islam came about. And then they don't like it, and that's how they complain to the police. Then you, you're accused of Islamophobia and all sorts of other things. Well, it seems to me what often happens is that when people lose an argument, they almost, almost like they go crying for money. Of course. And so the police are very eager to take their complaints because, like I said earlier on, they, they, they actually want to not have these crowds gathering in Broadmead. They don't want to have people listen to this. They don't want to be taking uh, complaints from people who says that I'm deeply offensive to them. So what do they do? Uh, they ask people to, to then take the complaints a little further, and that's what they've done over a period of six to nine so months. So are, are you saying that the police are actually almost kind of grooming people to make complaints? We have, we have evidence between myself and the constabulary where they've accepted by email correspondence, that officers had literally gone out to people and said, we would like you to go complain about this man. He is offensive. They've used the word offensive. He is offensive. Complain about him. And so the, this will be played out in a court case in uh, November. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Well, I remember, I think it was about two years ago uh, we spoke to you. Maybe it was about the pandemic. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, at the time, you said that the Bristol Mayor Marvin Rees had passed you whilst you were doing your preaching in Bristol City Centre mm -hmm. and said, well, we don't want your sort of Christianity here in Bristol. That's exactly what he said to me. Because I, I, I asked him uh, a few questions on the day. I was very respectful of him and I tried to reach him even afterwards by email. He refused to accept my calls. He refused to accept my emails. Uh, I, had to, I had to push a little further trying, you know, listen, Christians believe in reconciliation. You know, in, in, in finding the common ground, in finding peace. So I wanted to find peace with Marvin Rees and say, we're in the same city, let's work together. He refused to work with me. He said that I have an Americanized version of Christianity, I have a Trump version of Christianity, and really what we were doing was opening up a Bible and saying, this is what the Bible says. And he refused to accept that. He refused to talk to me, he just merely walked away. Well, isn't it fascinating? I think sometimes people want the Bible to say what they would like it to say and they like to i mean the thing is i mean you know maybe you could be accused of the same thing saying well you're skirting over certain passages in the bible sure. and focusing on ones that you want to be true and that's exactly why we love the debate in the public square there's not tony there are certain questions that i've been asked that really stop me in the public square i've had to go back and look at the scriptures again <laughs> and say well what do i say about this and so it's good for me i welcome it i welcome people challenging me intellectually spiritually i welcome a good debate and an argument uh, and that should be that should not be stifled in the public square come on uh, uh, you know great great thinkers and philosophers and, and ideologies and education came about by debate and reasoning and discussion well that's right people like john wesley yeah. and uh, the methodist church was very strong here in bristol particularly amongst the miners yeah. uh, flocking to see his uh, interpretation of the bible which was very much against the church of england and <laughs> actually <laughs> yeah actually, actually talk about the church of england so so the constabulary has recruited the church of england to form a, a judgment of me. So they've sent the Church of England my sermons, they sent this, the Church of England uh, video recordings of me, and the Church of England has compiled a three-page dossier on me saying that nobody should believe Pastor D.M. Mughal and his congregation because his idea of hell, sin, and judgment is not real, but layers and layers of historical interpretation. Well, now, you, you join then uh, a whole generation <laughs> of hundreds of years of dissenters and nonconformists. Of course. I mean, we've got loads of, you know, the Baptists, the Methodists, uh, the Quakers, which I'm one of. Uh, I mean, there's a whole load of these nonconformists that rejected this official Church of England view yes. of what, how to interpret the bible so so what's the situation now you're, be, you're being told what exactly is in this notice what does it tell so this, you to do so this notice was issued to me uh when i went into one of my regular meetings with the police i'd go in every month to see how everyone's doing uh to work on our relationship together and at that meeting i was issued a notice and a detective who was investigating me for nine months i didn't even know they were investigating well me. maybe this is one of the reasons we've got so much knife crime out there <laughs> that you've got some detective like for a best part of a year investigating offense uh investigating Investigating what someone has said about the Bible on Bristol right. streets. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, so I was served this notice and, and, and parts of these points said, for example, I'm not allowed to speak to an evolutionist or an atheist. I'm not allowed to, I'm not allowed to compare Christianity to any other religion in the public square. 
In other words, comparative religious studies must not be done in the public square. I have to get their permission if I want to preach. I've got to preach only for an hour. <laughs> I'm not allowed to bring anybody else into Bristol to preach in my place. I'm not, not allowed to play a recording of my sermons in the public square. And lastly, I'm not allowed to use any language that is derogatory against the LGBTQ+. Plus so, people. for example, you're not allowed to actually read out verses of the Bible. I mean, there, there is a verse that says that a woman should not be allowed to preach. Now, that could be seen as offensive to any woman in your audience. Of course. And I've, I've, I've had people that walked up to me and said to me, my, my mom's a vicar. And I would say to them very kindly, I would disagree with you, and not just me disagreeing with you, the Bible would disagree. And they would end up swearing me well, and saying, right. well, you know... This Normally, is it's the people that start shouting and screaming that realise that they've lost the argument. Anyway, let's just bring Martin summers in here martin you know i know you were involved in this whole speaker's corner business in bristol a few years ago where there was an active encouragement uh, on college green just outside city hall uh, to have these sorts of debates mainly political debates given but uh, out in public and it is of course an important tradition of free speech well interestingly speaker's corner in london i went to speak there during the first gulf war in 1991 so i spoke there every day against the war and I got big crowds, and uh, the police came up to me at one stage and said, you do realise that the bylaws of the park say that you can only speak here on Sunday afternoons after midday and only on religious subjects. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you'd better arrest me then. Mm -hmm. And they walked away. Mm -hmm. So in actual fact, that these, these public squares, and don't forget the Speaker's Corner in London was the place where they used to go to watch the executions. Mm. So the creation of a, of a space where people speak, people think that it's a, it's a freedom of speech, but the actual bylaws of the park don't allow freedom of speech, although in practice the police do allow freedom of speech, but the, the law says that they can shut you down. And I think this, this issue of what is a public space, I can imagine in Broadmead, for example, where people are shopping and people are trying to get money in the shops, they don't want big crowds of people mm. rowing and arguing. And, of course, back in the day in Bristol... Uh, it was very common. I mean, Joe, Joe Br B Banks, who's a regular contributor on this show, I'm going to see him later. Uh, he was talking about Ernie Bevan, who became eventually the for foreign secretary and in fact, he was the founder of the Transport and General Workers Union. He was a worker in Bristol. And, they, and in that era, in, in the, in before the First World War, and uh, the, then people used to go on a Sunday afternoon mm. and the, after the, they'd been to church, they would have these big political meetings. Mm. And it was part of the tradition. But, of course, what's happened subsequently is the Broadmead is now for shopping. Yeah, yeah. but it, interestingly, like you, like you said, uh, one of the things we make sure as a Christian church is we have our own internal policy. We don't shop. We don't stop trade. We're not in front of shops. We yeah. make sure that the crowd doesn't get big enough to affect others. So we, we, yeah. we try to keep the peace. So, for example, we're, we're outside you know, Sainsbury's. It's a long shop front. Uh, um, windows, we're not affecting their door, their trade, yeah. and whatever. Still, nothing that we say to the police is, is, is making any difference. They know all of this. Uh, they absolutely do not want us to, to gather there uh, to, to, to speak this version of Christianity. To such a point, there's a store in uh, Broadmead that actually flies a drone into me. So, uh, and, and, and the police have got it on camera. Uh, the man's not been arrested. And if, if, if I just for a moment touch somebody with my Bible or my yeah. elbow, I'm, a, I'm immediately called in for assault and things like that. So this is a man from a shop in Broadmead flying a drone into me, and he's allowed to get away with that. Well, it's obvious that he doesn't like you being there and right. what you're saying. So yeah. when you say you're trying to get like, these people aren't necessarily accepting that, are they? Right, yeah. Well, what the police, it seems to me, have done is create, uh, actually create a space for lawlessness by letting people like him get away with that. Yes, indeed, a space for lawlessness. I mean, there, there were many times when um, the police were right there, and we said to them, please help us. Uh, this man is tearing our signboard or destroying well, the Well, I mean, system. let's be clear, there's lots of people with mental illness roaming around out there. They look at anything like this, they kind of almost attracted attracted to it uh, like moths to the flame. Of course, yeah. I mean, we, the police officer would be right there. And we'd say, can you help us, please? And they say, no, we're not helping you. Literally say to us, we're not helping you because we don't agree with you. And uh, so so uh, the last time we were out, which was uh, last month, I actually said to the officer, officer, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a citizen of the United Kingdom, and I'm calling you as a citizen to help me. This man is assaulting me. And the officer refused to respond to, he says, I'm not coming to help you. And he was five meters away from me. He could hear everything that's going on. 
uh, we, uh, our signboards were being uh, ripped apart. Uh, we were threatened with violence, and yet they did not respond. Were they not? Uh, it doesn't sound to me like even Somerset police are really acting as uh, law enforcement at all. In fact, they are standing by watching people breaking the law. We're seeing this increasingly. If you look around the country, uh, that the, the uh, police just do not respond sometimes when uh, people are calling for their help. Tony, it's, it's absolutely it's absolutely ludicrous. Uh, the training that goes into the police officers. The time that I spent, when you asked me why did I first go into the constabulary, the time was the time spent with them was on how to better police, how to how to be better trained to handle, for example, a protest in Bristol or preaching in Bristol, and they're not qualified for that. Here's the thing: in this dossier that they put together, three pages of the dossier is about police officers who responded to my preaching. So, in other words, somebody complained, they responded to it, and the police officers have written that they're suffering post-traumatic stress disorder because of what I preached. Come on, are these guys strong enough to come to my house to protect me from a burglar? Are they strong enough to come to my house to to protect me from somebody who's going to do harm to me? If they if they if they're so uh, uh, terrified by by somebody saying that there's biblical marriage and this is what biblical marriage is and you're going to go to hell if you don't uh, if you don't repent of your sin and that's causing them post traumatic stress disorder. I mean, come on, who are these police officers? Well, I mean, it's quite important that those words from the Bible are alive today, isn't it? Of they're not they're not just sitting there in a book on a shelf gathering dust. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and so we. So when they say I'm not allowed to speak to an evolutionist, I'm not allowed to speak to an atheist, I'm not allowed to compare Christianity to any other religion, what they're saying is that every other philosophy and religion is accepted in Bristol except your Christianity. We don't want your Christianity. And you know what they said to me? They said, okay, why don't you be like the Jehovah's Witness who stands on the corner? I said, I respect the Jehovah's Witness. And, and that's what they do. Well, it is a cult, but yes, you of course. It. they are people as I said, well. I said I, want, I said, I want to do what the Apostle Paul did. He went, he went, in the, he went into the area he debated with the Greeks and said that's what we want to do and I said isn't that a good thing uh, well they seem to think otherwise yeah they do uh, anyway uh, Martin you don't believe in evolution do you so why is um, uh, is, is Deere allowed to talk to you the police are saying no well I do believe in evolution <laughs> right, so you do Sorry, but he, uh, uh, well I mean it, it strikes me as very odd because as you say there are going to be very different views and surely it should be the case that people should be able to have meetings about those views and those meetings should be, you know, properly policed so that people have a dis- you know, Most people, if they're not interested in your view, they can walk just away. walk by. Of course. They don't have to do anything, do they? So, sure. And, 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 and this is one of the things, you know, uh, the crowds uh, will stay there for a very long time, up until two hours, you know, at a time uh, sometimes. And, and I often say to them, Many of you have called me foolish and stupid and all sorts of names that are not worthy to be named. But yet you're standing here for two hours listening to me. You know why? Uh, you know why? If, if I'm foolish, what, what does that make you? You know, if, if you if you're listening to me, uh, it's because they're interested. There's something of what is being said yeah. that 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 it either tugs at their heart or must have the ring of truth to it. I yeah. think, and yeah, yeah. Um, it's absolutely appalling to hear taxpayers' money and the police force being used to. Uh, in an attempt to shut this down, even though they haven't actually shut it down. So uh, where and when are you actually there? Is it a kind of random thing? You turn up every few weeks? No, or, no. Or where are you? In, so, we're, so we're in Bristol Broadmead. We change locations within the Broadmead area, sometimes even outside the Hippodrome. On what uh, day of the week? On a Saturday, um, we're out. Um, on the uh, Sabbath? <laughs> well, for, oh, the Jewish Sabbath. Anyway. Yeah, well, the, the, well, the Christian Sabbath uh, is uh, not the Saturday, and we can talk about that if you want to. Uh, but but we're out on the Saturday, uh, normally for about four hours, and um, um, that's when all of our church comes out, and we have people from other parts of the country that join us as well uh, that come out on a Saturday. Um, yeah, so there is something going on here, isn't there? It's quite obvious to me, and yep. I think many of our listeners will of see. Course. Well, this is. Um, uh, these sorts of debates are controlled nowadays. They're on television, they're on the radio, they're in the newspapers, they're in various other media. And it's almost like the, the conversations that you have down the pub that couldn't happen during the lockdowns. Yeah. It's now, uh, there is an attempt to control this debate. So where is that going to go, that attempt? Well, this is, this is the scary part. I'm a, I'm a Christian today, and somebody listening to me may not agree with my view on how the world came into existence. They may believe in evolution. I'll say, good for you that you're standing on what you believe. I respect your freedom of speech, and I want you to have the freedom of speech. If you think I'm talking absolutely rubbish, I respect that about you. But I want you also to understand, if they're going to shut me down now, they can easily shut you down for what you believe. So I'm here to protect your freedom. Tony, I'm an immigrant to this land 25 years. 
and here I am fighting for freedom of speech and freedom of religion is something I did not want to be, be entangled with. You didn't but expect I, it. I maybe. didn't expect it. And here I am. I'm drawn into it. I'm going to court on the 29th and 30th of November at my own cost. At my own cost, even in Somerset uh, Constabulary, we should meet this notice. I have had to fight it at my own cost. And they said to me, this is absolutely legal. You can't contest this. And within a month, they withdrew it. Within one month, they withdrew it, which means they were wrong in the first place. But I'm having to pay for this. Well, it does seem that they're wasting a lot of their time. Now, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, yeah. right, because I'd like you and Martin to discuss evolution. <laughs> uh, that's and not devil's advocate. That's, uh, that's satanic uh, <laughs> influence. <laughs> yes, you're well, just trying to create just, trouble. I you're a troublemaker. See you're if you can have a discussion without <laughs> coming to blows. And I think you can. Oh, yes. And I'd like to prove that this notice is nonsense uh, because what they're doing is they're saying well this is a worst case scenario and therefore you can't talk to anybody yeah. who doesn't agree with evolution so let's start with you martin what's your basic idea about why evolution is true well it's uh, i'm not a, a trained scientist as such but i read i've read a lot about this because it's very influential in modern philosophy Evolution is regarded as very influential in modern philosophy and things like uh, Daniel Dennett, for example, uh, the, uh, he's written a book called um, Consciousness Explained, which shows, to my satisfaction anyway, that the forces that are at work in evolution have led to the evolution of consciousness, which is what we, you know, we're having a conscious discussion now. This, there's, there's actually quite, it's quite tightly argued scientific argument about why this came about. And, um, you've, you've, of course, you've got, uh, creationists who are literal creationists, and you've also got what are, what are called, um, those who believe in design. Some kind yeah, of design. Create, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, intelligent design. It's intelligent design. But I mean, the mainstream biology professor's view is that there is no such thing as intelligent design, that in actual fact, everything we see has in fact evolved from. Uh, you know, it's well, very, very basic, simple blocks. The basic principle in the first is place. Na natural selection, isn't it? The idea that if something uh, has a mutation which it makes it slightly more efficient or uh, effective as an organism, then it, this is the how evil. This is the basic principle. Isn't it? This is it. Yes, and of course, it isn't derived from scripture at all. Obviously, it's it's, come a, it, it's derived from a, the Enlightenment idea that by experimenting and, and and looking at things, we can come to conclusions. And there's been a lot of it's been very influential in lots of different because if, once you start thinking about evolution think about a, a artificial intelligence this is about algorithms which evolve yeah which we get cleverer and cleverer by by process of evolution so this idea of evolution has become it's it's what's called uh, i think it was somebody called it darwin's dangerous idea i can't remember which philosopher wrote that so in other words there are, uh, I don't agree with some of the attitudes that you get from people like Richard Dawkins, because he seems to think that he's got to be anti-religious. It's perfectly logical that evolution could exist and there could still be a God behind it all. Now, I know that's not scriptural, but it's a logical point. I mean, God, God could be behind evolution. And I would say my, my mother is a priest in the Church of England, she's retired now. That would probably be her view. I don't, she's not against evolution, but she would say, well, God's all-powerful. He, yeah. he, he can make evolution if he wants to. Okay, so what about you, so, dear? So, well, how would you answer that? So, um, I'd begin by asking the evolutionists to explain... No, no fisticuffs so far. Yeah, I'd, well, this is how it plays out in the public square. I'd begin to ask the evolutionists to explain or to define what, what evolutionism is. Uh, so, you know, and, and very often... Uh, um, a number of people or many people cannot actually define what that is in the sense of how did man come about? They say, well, we evolved over time. Okay, what does it mean? Uh, so if we go scientifically and, and so we, if we talk uh, science, we say, okay, here's the equation. Put the equation on the board. Show me on the board how, uh, how man came into existence. So they'll have, to, they'll have to put it in this form. Something, the complexities of the human world, came from nothing. Something, the complexities of man, came from nothing. Now, if you put that on a board, it's scientifically impossible because something cannot come from nothing. Well, yes, it can because chemicals can react with each other and eventually maybe produce amino acids. Okay, so wonderful. The building blocks of life. Wonderful. Where do those chemicals come from? Well, they're, uh, they're just there. They've always yeah, been there. Go. Maybe it's a big bang. <laughs> so in order for something to bang, in order for it to explode, let's, say, let's take you back to school, the fire triangle. In order for you to have a fire triangle, you need to have three elements. You take away one of the elements, it refuses to burn. It refuses to be a fire. 
The same with the combustion, same with the, the Big Bang. Where do those elements come from in order to bang? And that's where the evolutionist now starts to lose his rag uh, if he doesn't uh, know his stuff and say, well, you know, uh, um, uh, starts to rant and rave about things or this is what happens in the public square. Very rarely do we get like a professor from Bristol who's sitting prepared to sit in the public square and say, okay, we, we, we've, got a, we, we've got a professor coming into our church on um, the, the end of October, Professor Stuart Burgess, for he's the he's the he's the uh, the professor at the University of Bristol. He's designed uh, components for uh, the space station. He's designed a sprocket system for the o- Olympic bike. And ask him where, and that's only two of the things he's invented. Ask him where he got his ideas from. He'll tell you from the knee joint, which he which he talks about. From an evolutionist perspective and also from a creationist perspective. In other words, for example, this which evolved first, the tongue or hunger, the stomach or the teeth. You know, how did how did man uh, start walking? Which part of his limbs start evolving first? Well, I can tell you, you see, the idea is in evolution is that it starts off with a single cell organism, then uh, the, the, the whole thing gets bigger and bigger over millennia so or, the, or maybe millions of years. So the single cell organism, if you want to call that mitochondria, where did it come from? The fact that it's living. The fact that there's a life in it, where did that life come from? So I would, I would, I would challenge people right back to the beginning. And so, 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 so forgetting about Darwin and Dawkins and Hawkins and the rest of them, I would say let's go back to the beginning. Uh, how can something, that mitochondria, that living cell, come from nothing? So Martin, it's, is this a debate, debate worth having? Well, I think what's interesting, what you're saying is that uh, the evolution – is, has got to be, you've got to have something coming from nothing. I think this is, this is, scientists can't resolve this. The Big Bang, the, the, and the actual fact, science uh, is, is such a creature that there are scientists who don't believe in the Big Bang anymore. Yeah. Yeah? They've, they've said, because things can change. Of course. You know, you, you suddenly think, hang on a minute, we didn't, the, the, our perception of this was wrong. And that's what makes it different from a, the appeal to authority in scripture, because it can change. And there are scientists who will disagree with the Big Bang. They don't agree with it. But, of course, the whole idea, something from nothing, why is anything here at all? And why is there life? And actually, we don't know. Because, well, it's, and of course, it's quite possible that a creator god may have created all of these things. Yeah. But, of course, it still not, doesn't help you in terms of scripture. Even if, you know, because scripture is very, you know, it's six days to create the world and all the rest of it. If, you, if you've got a different view where evolution is something that you can put within a theological context that to my mind is is on ex- I, i've got no problem with that well, because of course that makes perfect sense and in actual fact it's an it's an unknowable thing well, those who want to believe in a god can believe in it and those who don't don't it there actually does are. it actually you, you can't put evolution into a biblical theology because the evolution involves a development of a of a single cell into an animal into a human being yeah and that takes away the theos of of the theos into man god created man in his image and so man cannot be in the image of god if if he's a result of random chance and coincidence well i i would just i mean some some would i hear what you say but there there is definitely a school of thought that you can have all this random chance but of course what is chance yeah if it's it it could all be determined and and there's it's not clear um, you know, you can see once you get to this level, sure. it's, it's quite possible to hold, hold different isn't it, views. Isn't it about fair it? to say, Martin, that in most mainstream universities, in science departments, etc., I mean, we've had several creation scientists on this program over the years. Uh, the, 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 the whole idea of God and and creation is rather poo pooed. The idea is completely normal now. Uh, uh, evolution is pretty much accepted across most of our educational institutions. Well, I think what we're talking about here is you could ex- there is there is an intersection set of people who believe in evolution but who also believe in God. Now, I'm not saying that that I'm one of those people, but I'd say my mother would probably fall into that category. Um, but I think you know the the, the, the there's the, but we can debate these things. Of course, we can. But people are going to at the end of the day going to so have my, their my views. My point about is, it, I'm they? trying to get to a point which I'm, maybe I'm not doing very well at it. But I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, in our in our education system, this is quite an important. I think. Yeah, well, it is, well, it is it's important. An important sort of thing for particularly teenage uh, kids in secondary school uh, that, that there should be this kind of debate happen. Well, Say, for example, in a biological, but a biology. Well, lesson. well, they do. They do. I mean, I work in schools, Tony, and these things are debated. But of course, there are two things there's religious education and there is biology and they're separate classes 
And of course, there's a debate between religion. So, I mean, some people, you know, this, this debate goes on. I mean, especially in primary schools, I've just seen, we, we, we've had, they, in year six, they've had all this stuff about what do we believe about, about evolution, and including, pe you know, people saying that they don't believe in, or they believe in design, yeah. they, they are, they're exposed to all of these arguments. But right. of course, in a biology class, when you're moving up to sort of university level, senior level, and all the rest of it, you've got to accept evolution, otherwise you're not going to be taken in the university. And, 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 and that's, and that's where you know, we're obviously going to disagree. And I, I think the first point is, when you say it's debated at schools, you have people that are, the, 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 the game is already slanted towards a, a certain side. For example, somebody that's making the case for creation is somebody that's pulling stuff off the internet. They're not qualified to make the case. There are RE teachers. My, my, both my daughters uh, were teachers in Bristol, and they taught RE in philosophy. And um, they were coming home and telling me that RE teachers are not actually prepared to teach RE because they themselves are not con convicted of something or convinced of something, and therefore will pull something off the internet and go and tell the class. You have a biology teacher who studied biology, and we're not, uh, and, 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 and good for them. I'm in agreement with what biology is. I, myself, before I became a minister, was a lecturer of anatomy and physiology. And when I went to, when I was assigned my first cadaver, I had my own cadaver to work on, and I thought this cadaver is going to draw me away from God. It did the opposite. Where every vessel that I opened in the cadaver pointed me more towards how is it possible that this person is so wonderfully created? You know, uh, how is it that the vessels have these valves going one way only and not the other way? How is it that there are 11 million nerve endings in that eye and exactly the same in that person's eye? How is it that that's random chance and coincidence? It's perfect that somebody designed well, it. Well, I think in a way, many people just look around them and they say, wow, there must be some sort of, maybe not in the centre of Bristol, uh, but certainly out in the beautiful countryside somewhere, and, and saying, well, there, Martin, that the, the, this, this is so beautiful. There does seem to be an element of design here. But that may, they may be just conning themselves, saying. Well, I think that, the, the, you know, the, 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 we've got to distinguish between what you might call biblical uh, fundamentalism uh, the idea of intelligent design and what you might call the mainstream of evolutionist view in biology. So they're all, they're, they're three separate strands. Um, uh, I think in, in, when you talk about, we don't have really, what used to be called religious knowledge when I was a kid in schools, because mm -hmm. schools were Christian and therefore, you know, we, it, 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 you were we basically learning Christianity. You still have got some schools which are. Well, ours, based, ours wasn't. We had RE, religious education. Yeah, yeah well, that's right. But I mean, but, but, it's a bit of a dog's breakfast about who's in, in control of they schools. Had a quiet, in this country. They didn't have any sort of chapel or anything. They had a quiet room. Yeah, but I mean, the well, idea was that this is a secular thing just as much as it is any other religion. Yeah, though. I mean, Different schools, have diff different thing, schools right? have different schools have different you know it's become a bit of a dog's breakfast as I say in this yeah. country about who runs schools but in, in mainstream schools religious education is about all different kinds of religion it's for, it's for I think it is important that children learn about religious beliefs they should they should learn about their own parents religious beliefs and their own back and everybody else's as well yeah. it's, a, it's an important part of, 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 of being human to know what other people believe yeah yeah, I mean, uh, the, 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 that's the, ideal, the ideal situation would be that you'd have schools and teachers giving equal opportunity for both sides of the argument. But when a school and a particular teacher is slanted towards one way and, and, and almost laughs and scoffs at the opposite idea, that's not education. But that's what's happening at university level right now, where you, you know, universities are supposed to be the place where you come to that place in life, you look out over, over the panoramic view, you have all of these philosophies that you're looking at, your, your, your lecturers are, challenge, are challenging you on, in so many ways to be intellectual and to think and, and, and to have these philosophies. But what's happening is every university you go to now, they, have, they, actually, they have, actually have one particular way of looking at things. If I, if, I went to, if I went to Bristol University and said, I want to come today and talk about my, my Christian views, I'd be shut down. Yeah, but you, you, you wouldn't be shut... I mean, you shouldn't be shut down. Yeah. But what, I'm, what I would Sorry, also... If, if I was invited, I'm saying. Yes. If I was invited. Yeah. Let's say yeah. the Christian Union invited... Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that, yeah. And we, we know there's tensions around whether, yeah. whether people are being invited or not. But in the biology department itself, there are intelligent design people in the academic structure. Yeah. They do exist, but they're a minority. Yeah. And, and of course, it's, it's a legitimate view... But, of course, it's not the majority view of biologists as we speak. Anyway, one of the people who's influenced me quite a lot in terms of my beliefs when it comes to evolution is a guy called James Perloff over in the United States. He had an extremely popular millions of views on his video about evolution and creation, uh, which was then taken down off of YouTube and then it popped up somewhere else. 
uh, and I think the title of the video is God is Real, Here's the Proof, something like that. Anyway, James, we're going to hear from now, uh, because here he does a, a little discussion, uh, a monologue about the debate between evolution and creation. Here's an extract from that now. Billions of years ago, when the right chemicals formed our single-celled ancestors by chance, and then these single-celled creatures began to evolve into multicellular creatures, and they became the first uh, seagoing invertebrates. Invertebrates, a creature without a backbone like a jellyfish. Then the invertebrates evolved into fish, and then fish yearned to come ashore, and so their fins started to evolve into legs, and they became the first amphibians, which are creatures, of course, that can go on land or water like a frog. And then amphibians evolved into reptiles, reptiles evolved into mammals, and then eventually within the class of mammals, you had these ape-like creatures who evolved into man. And that's a theory in a nutshell. It might be taught a little differently from one school of thought to another, but that's it. Uh, and that's basically what your, your kids are taught in school. So to start at the beginning, the origin of life, and Darwin did talk about that, the origin of species, said that life began in a warm little pond, but after a while they realized that a pond wouldn't last long enough for significant evolution to take place, so they changed it to the ocean. So let's see what's wrong with this. Now, I've got a, uh, a can here of uh, all-natural cola, and uh, if we look at it, uh, it says cola. It's got, it says 12 ounces, which it reminds us, uh, in this case, is 354 mLs. It says Whole Foods on it, and it's got a list of ingredients, the amount of fat and sodium, and um, uh, it's got a uh, barcode, which is scannable, and it's got a pop top. Uh, which works very nicely, and it's got uh, cola inside, uh, very tasty, right? Now, does anybody think that this can and its contents and the printing on the outside could have originated by pure chance? And obviously not. I mean, it's too well designed. So that raises the question of how could a cell come about by chance because it's astronomically more complex than the can I just showed you. And uh, I want to give you a quote. Uh, the quote is this, quote, A simple one-celled bacterium, R. coli, contains DNA information units that are the equivalent of 100 million pages of Encyclopedia Britannica, unquote. And that quote is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. <clears throat> now, cells uh, have a functional unit called proteins. That's their basic unit. And uh, even in a bacterial cell, there's thousands of different proteins. And not to get technical, but... Proteins are found down in a smaller building block called amino acids, and there's hundreds in one protein, and they have to be in the right order. And uh, some of your listeners, I'm sure, have heard of Francis Crick. He won the Nobel Prize for co-discovering the structure of DNA. And he calculated what the odds would be of getting a protein by chance, you know, in the ancient ocean. You know what the odds are, according to Francis Crick? The odds are 1 in 10 to the power of 260. And if you want to know how big a number that is, you couldn't fit that many electrons in the known universe. Hmm. Uh, mathematicians really say that anything with odds greater than 1 in 10 to the power of 50 is impossible. So it would be impossible to get one protein by chance, let alone the thousands a cell would need. And think about it. A cell would need the ability to ingest nutrients, expel waste. And really think about this one. This first cell formed by chance before it died in the span of one lifetime would have had to develop and perfect the process of cellular reproduction because if it didn't, there never would have been a second cell and Darwin's evolutionary process would stop right there. So Darwin's process would stop right there, Martin. So how do you answer that one? <laughs> well, I mean, this, this is an interesting debate because, of course, it all presumes that, we did, that the actual account of evolution is correct, but it's saying that it's so complicated, that an individual cell is so complicated that it must have been created by God. But that's not the creation of the Earth in six days, is it? Well, this is, this is, this is, well this, what, what James Perloff is describing there is nothing to do with the Bible at all. Well, he's actually looking at it from a very, very scientific point of view. And so when we draw science into it, we have to, and that's why we said we can't put the equation on the board. And, and, and Hawking's and Dawkins would agree with that. And that's why they're moving away from the idea. Um, uh, they don't want people to talk about the fact that something came from nothing. They kind of, they kind of actually have, have said that, that the creationist is right to say that something cannot come from nothing. So where did it come from? So the creationists would say, well, the answer to the question is it came from God. And actually the first few lines of the Bible is scientific. It says this, the Genesis chapter 1 says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And any, 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 any scientist worth his salt will say, let's talk about time, space and matter. 
if you time space and matter have to be in existence at the same time they cannot be they cannot evolve you cannot have time evolving first and space evolving first and then matter evolving first for example if you had matter and no space where would you put the matter if you had space and matter without time when would you put it so they all have to be together at the same time and so how do we explain that well the bible explains that the bible says in the beginning time god created the heaven space and the earth matter so they all created this at the same time that is that perfectly fits into the scientific world view that time space and matter have to exist at the same time and so um uh in in adam in the garden in the earth was an already uh existing well when god created it he created it like it's millions of years old he created it like it's already been functioning fully functioning for millions of years old is it impossible for god to do that no he's god that's the very definition of him that he can do it uh and so the question then comes to ask is why does man reject that why would why would man reject that uh well there's various answers to that question uh why well because um you know very often very often people say that christianity is the crutch that people lean on uh others say that um you know um i think it was lennox uh the um northern ireland uh, you know theologian who said that um uh evolutionists and atheists are, are uh, afraid of the light and therefore uh, live in the dark uh the light being uh the science that actually comes from the scriptures in fact uh astronomers um early astronomers were basing their views on the universe from the bible uh the bible talks about the earth as a as a sphere as a ball uh, the bible talks about it hanging in space uh the book of job in the psalms it also you know uh, says so um and I, and i think i think the worth and the value of man uh, didn't come about from an evolutionary process the worth and the value of man the reason why you respect me and i respect you and the reason why we want peace and the reason why we have empathy and love and we can share this with one another is because of of the moral value that god put into man rather than what how it came about through an evolutionary process so martin the one thing's for sure uh, over the centuries people have been believing in god less and less haven't they particularly mm-hmm. here here in the western world here in the uk i mean if you get to go back 3 400 years almost everybody did and maybe they were did because they were told that they had to believe in god well i mean the human society as obviously you know it keeps changing and transforming uh i mean it's quite clear that there, there were you know in his historical terms hardly anybody didn't believe in god there was nobody who didn't believe in it or, or a god but of course but once you say a god you start to you start to open course, the, yeah. you start to open the, you know well what is this god that we all because then people disagree about that uh, I think the, w- 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 this is an interesting discussion because I think by having to debate with these scientific mm. ideas, it refines your own views. Yes, because 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 I think there's a lot of there's a lot of potential common ground here if you can accept that the, 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 if God is as great as you say, all of these things could be true. The evolutionist perspective could be true. But we still the fundamental question: Why is there anything at all instead of nothing? Nobody really knows how to answer that, do they? And I can't see that any possible experiment you could carry out would give you an answer. Well, look, let's wind this up with both of you uh, saying why you think, and maybe you first, Martin, that this debate uh, that's taking place with Deer on a Saturday uh, afternoon down in Broadmead is, is important, an important debate to protect. Well, I think freedom of speech is important to protect, and obviously I support your right to freedom of speech. I think what part of the problem is, is that people are actually quite belligerent about their views, and they're not necessarily as sophisticated in putting them forward as we're doing here, because this is, a, 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 you know, an informal discussion in a, in, a, in a controlled way. But when you're in the middle of the streets, you're going to have some people coming up to say, you know, they, they, they just, they, they don't really want to have a discussion. They want to have an argument, and that's partly to do with the, you know, people just being it's belligerent a, it's and silly. It's a debate which is not happening elsewhere, isn't it? So this is surely what the street's for. We're not, sorry, we're not, we're not creating platforms for these debates. I mean, one of the reasons I will not, many times, um, I've, I've asked the question, do I need to go back? Why do I need to get beaten up? Why do I have to have, you know, depending on the weather, if it's summertime, I get slushies and milkshakes thrown at me. Now winter, I'll get coffees thrown at me. Why do I need to do this? Why, don't I, why do I need to get beaten up? And I'll tell you, Tony, listen, the number of people that have come to me afterwards when all the crowds have disappeared and said, thank you so much, I didn't realize that what you just said. 
Or for example, when does life begin on the abortion issue or slavery in the Bible or on this political issue that you brought from a Christian worldview? I, and they would, they would wait for the, well, that's another problem anyway. Why would they wait for the crowd to disappear? Because they're too scared in the middle of the crowd to say, I actually agree with you. Oh, tell me some more. Because if they do that, the crowd's going to jump on them. And so they wait until the end. And I have now realized I preach from half past 12 to half past four. I'm now there till six o'clock knowing that people are going to hang around to talk with me. And they say, thank you so much for that. I've had University of Bristol students who are doing masters in uh, uh, genetics say to me, we're going to prove you wrong today. At the end of it, come and shake my hand and say, you've changed my mind. And so I'm going to continue to do that. Well, isn't it interesting? Uh, so uh, whereabouts is your church and how do people find you? Um, we're, in, we're in Lockleys um, on uh, Romney Avenue um, and... Um, uh, it's uh, Romney Avenue. It's, the church is called Spirit of Life Reformed Baptist Church. We a, are a Reformed church, uh, meaning it goes back to the Reformation, Martin Luther, John Calvin. Uh, we hold to a Reformed doctrine. Uh, we're very conservative in our in our biblical views and our biblical practice. And uh, so, uh, so like, like we wouldn't have a, wo- a woman minister, we wouldn't have women elders, uh, a woman lead the church. And and we've been uh, we've been called into question for that. And we just bought this property in Lockleys. And we went onto the Lockleys homepage and said to them, hey, we're the new church here. And they said to us, fabulous. We thought it's, the property is going to be sold to some flats and you know developers. Thank you so much that you bought the building. Welcome to the community. Somebody decided to, to Google us and went into our doctrinal statement and saw in our doctrinal statement that we believe that it is men who lead the church. They turned the entire community against us and now want us out of the community. They said, you no longer belong in this community with your views. Well, I mean, I would have thought that there were people, uh, you know, that's they're, they're, maybe they're trying to represent a specific part of the community which they don't necessarily represent. Yeah. They more represent themselves, which is what we're finding so much True. in journalism and politics as well. Uh, anyway, I hope you can stay with us for a little while because we're going to be discussing the Holy Land after the break. The first lesson is written in the 14th chapter of the prophet Hosea, beginning to read at the first verse in which the prophet speaks words of blessing and hope. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, Take away all guilt, accept that which is good, and we will offer the fruit of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. We will say no more, our God, to the work of our hands. In you the orphan finds mercy. I will heal their disloyalty. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall strike root like the forests of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like that of Lebanon. They shall again live beneath my shadow. They shall flourish as a garden. They shall blossom like the vine, their fragrance shall be like the wine of Lebanon. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. Your faithfulness comes from me. Those who are wise understand these things. Those who are discerning know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Tonight's reading from the Old Testament. Still with us for a little while uh, is Pastor Dia Moodley and me. Tony Gosling. So we've got to start, obviously, with this uh, horrific, uh, we mentioned there in the Coral Even song on Radio 3 uh, earlier this week, uh, this uh, horrific attack last Saturday. Uh, we'll start with you, though, Martin. I mean, it, it, put it in context, 
this is being portrayed as almost coming out of the blue, but of course that's really not the case. Do you think it was justified what Hamas did on Saturday? I think th that if they'd st stuck to military targets, it would have been uh, extremely uh, effective. But because of, uh, you know, I'm afraid people people do fall... I mean, they, 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 from my point of view, they should have stuck to military targets. From their own point of view, they are very angry and bitter. And they feel that people in Israel haven't understood that they think that, that you know, because there's been loads and loads of civilians killed in Gaza by the Israelis far more than has been killed by the other side. This is the first time that they've actually managed to fight back in such a way as to cause real hurt to the other side. And don't forget that all of these uh, villages around Gaza, the people inside Gaza used to live in those villages and were driven out of those villages by the people who are now in them. Well, I noticed Vladimir Putin, the Russian president, uh, he intervened saying he found the whole thing horrific. And uh, if, if, a, uh, if a conflict like this has to develop, he was really condemning the, uh, the men for killing women and children. He said, look, if the men fall out, they should not be including the women and, women and children from I, either side. I think it's, it's pretty clear that even those who are uh, very much opposed to the state of Israel, are, nobody is, is saying that it's okay for what they did. I think everybody's pretty clear that it's 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 made it complicated to explain to the to the middle of the road people. I understand why they're as angry as they are, but a lot of people won't understand it. But of course, you can't tell the oppressed to. to you know, it's easy for me to say, sitting in my armchair, hundreds of miles away. Uh, a lot of these young lads that are fighting in Hamas have had loads of their family killed. They're bitter, and of course, in World War Two, for example, we incinerated thousands and thousands of German civilians, and nobody got punished for that. The creation of the State of Israel in the first place in the 1940s, the terrorist actions of the Ergun and the Haganah killed thousands and thousands of people, and they didn't get punished. They became the leaders of the new state, and Hamas are basically giving the, the Israeli state exact that they learned how to do this from the Israelis. The Israelis showed them if you're ruthless enough and you're very determined, you won't lose. You can pass. You, it's the only way to win, and that's how we won our state in the first place by blowing up the King David Hotel, by massacres at Deir Yassin, and so on, by the displacement of people. That's how the state was created. I mean, it is very much a British uh, responsibility. Anyway, thanks for staying with us for a few minutes, dear. Uh, be interesting to hear. I know you're going to be preaching on Sunday about this. Yeah, I'm going to be uh, talking to my church about this, and there's a lot of uh, talk within the church about what what does it mean to pray for Israel. Um, let me just say right now, my my position uh, theologically, biblically is. There is a secular state called Israel. Uh, it is not the Israel of the Bible. Uh, and, um, you know, the, 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 the Israel, the secular state, uh, is actually anti-biblical. You, you can't go to Jerusalem and preach Christ without having somebody say, I'm going to stab you with, with, with a knife or a screwdriver. Uh, and, and so you, they, they literally throw you out of Jerusalem. Uh, having said that, um, looked at the news, we, we're joined with everyone that says we mourn this uh, uh, life taken on, 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 on both sides, but especially uh, on the absolute slaughter of of children, the beheading of children, if that has truly happened, the beheading of children, and, and uh, it's absolutely horrible. Um, but the, uh, when I look at this, and um, I'm agreeing with what you're saying in the sense of, oh, okay, it, 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 for me, when I look at this, it wasn't just a military strategy. This is like a religious war, because part of their charter, if you read it, and if I understand it correctly, is to annihilate the, the Jews, is to annihilate the, the infidel. Uh, and, uh, you know, all those who disagree with them. Um, and so even when the video footage was shown of um, the Hamas man uh, taking uh, the lady by the hair and shoving her into a car, what are they all screaming? They were screaming, Allahu Akbar, praise be to their God. Oh, their God is the highest. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm imagining that that was, the, that was the, the, sh the shouts that came out of them even as they were beheading these children. Um, th th this is not a war to to gain ground uh, or to seize a piece of land or uh, to, to annex a particular place. This was to make a statement that your life is what we're coming after. Uh, and so um, what, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, encouraging my church on how to pray about this. And if you, uh, if you want to know about that, I can, I can talk about that. Because I, want, I, just want to, I don't want to pray for Israel only. 
uh, or I'm not praying for a state. I'm praying for the, the people of Israel, but also equally praying for the people of Palestine. I'm praying for Hamas, like I would pray for those who in Africa are seizing the children every time and taking them away uh, into their uh, the strongholds of, the, of, the, of their armies and, and raping them and causing them to give birth and whatever the case may be. We're praying for them also. This is the evil of man's heart on both sides. And so my, my, when I say pray for the peace of Jerusalem, listen, every United States president wants world peace. Every person who's crowned Miss Universe wants world peace. That's what they say. What are you going to do for one year? World peace. There is no peace with man unless there's peace with God. And the Bible says there is a prince of peace. He's called Jesus Christ. And unless there's peace with God, then there's peace with man. It's bizarre that uh, up until the creation of the Israeli state, actually there was relative peace in that part of the world. Christians, Muslims, Jews all lived happily together. We say, we, we say um, you know, relative peace. And we're, we, you know, we were talking about this the other day as well. Um, I, I was in the gym and I was talking to a lady from Russia and we were talking about the things happening in the Ukraine. And she's talking about how in communities they used to live together in, in harmony. And I asked her, um, was it because you were really compromising? Because if you live next door to somebody and you truly disagree with what they're saying and it convicts you that you believe in A and they believe in B, and how do you live together? Uh, are, you, are you then neglecting what you truly believe by compromising and therefore you're living together in those communities? Because if you really stood by what you believe, there would be conflict. Uh, and, and, and the Bible tells us so, tells me that, that there will be conflict. You know, Paul making it very clear, Jesus even making it clear, you go out in the world and tell people about you. They're going to hate you because they first hated me. Uh, uh, you know, and so there's, there is going to be this conflict that comes between people when you, when you disagree. Almost uh, inevitable. Anyway, um, thanks very much, dear, for hanging around with us. Uh, Spirit of Life Church. Have you got a website? I suppose you must have. Spiritoflife.org.uk. So thank you very much for joining us. We're going to hear now from Gabor Mate, who's Jewish himself. Uh, he was on a show. Uh, he lives actually over, I think, in New York.